NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. Local sponsorship is provided by the Muskogee County Friends of Libraries. I'd like to tell you about two stories from over 2,000 years ago. They were first told in Greece, and we call them the Iliad and the Odyssey by the poet Homer. The Iliad is the story of gods and heroes, of Helen whose face launched a thousand ships, of the Trojan hero Hector, who possessed all the virtues that the Greeks admired, strength, moderation, and discipline and of Achilles, the great Greek warrior ruled by his unbridled anger, who slays Hector and watches Troy burn. It is the tale of Achilles' friend, Odysseus, who tricked the Greeks into bringing the Trojans into their gates to destroy the city by creating the Trojan horse as an offering from the gods. At the end of the Trojan War, Ulysses begins his journey home, a story recounted in the Odyssey. The story is about wandering the world and returning home, encountering signs, omens, danger, seduction, and adventure. On his journey, Odysseus encounters the Lotus Eaters, Polyphemus, the one-eyed giant, he and his men meet Circe, who turns some of Odysseus's men into pigs, but helps him find his way home after a year in her company. With Circe's lessons and those of the gods, he resists the call of the sirens by lashing himself to the mast of his ship and skirts the dangers of Scylla and Charybdis as he passes between them on his ship. He is washed ashore and remains far from home with the goddess Calypso for seven years until he returns stealthily to his home in Ithaca where his virtuous wife Penelope has spent the years at her loom putting off the suitors who surrounded her and awaiting her husband's return. All of these stories have served artists over the years from the age of the ancient Greeks to the present while Homer's Odyssey is a story from ancient Greece, the themes of wandering off course, searching for home, meeting obstacles, and grieving losses all proved fertile ground for over 2,000 years. The stories were first illustrated on Greek vases. We call them vases, and some of them are delicate, but others are beefy terracotta pots, like ceramic flower pots with thick walls and muscular handles. These were made by working men and women in places like the Athenian Karemikos, where the quarter where the potters lived. They never knew that their works would be so highly prized. Here we see the Greek heroes, Ajax and Achilles from the Iliad, taking a break from battle in the Trojan War as they play dice on a pot decorated by the great black figure painter Exekius. On black figure pots, the painter depicted the figures and objects using a liquid clay called slip that turned black in the kiln. The result was dramatic images like this. That vignette of Ajax and Achilles spoke of how little control humans have over their fortune and it proves so popular that we see it again and again. Here, in a red figure painting, we see it depicted using a later technique, where the figures appear in a terracotta color against the black slip ground.
Later in the Trojan War, we see the epic battle between the noble Trojan prince Hector and the Greek hero, hero Achilles who defeats him. Achilles took the body of Hector and dragged it away behind his chariot, dishonoring the corpse that Hector's father, the Trojan ruler Priam, came to reclaim from Achilles. The story of Hector proved so enduring that the great French painter Jacques-Louis David chose it as the subject for one of his most important early paintings, Andromache Mourning Hector, where we see the body of Hector laid out as his wife Andromache holds their son as she grieves. Such stories of dedication, dedication to the family and the nation were powerful stuff in the 18th century that looked to Homer and the art of the Greeks for inspiration. What always strikes me, though, is how much emotion could be expressed using only two colors, the burnt orange of terracotta and the deep black slip. The ancient stories tell us that Achilles, too, died during the war with Troy. At his death, the magic armor of Achilles went to his friend Odysseus. Feeling abandoned and dishonored by his old friend, we see Ajax throw himself on his sword in this stark vase by Exekius. Using only those two colors, he matches or exceeds the drama of Jacques-Louis David. Now, the fall of Troy proved fertile ground for the imagination of the American artist Romar Bearden, who took on the story of the Odyssey in his 1977 series, A Black Odyssey. One of America's most original artists, Bearden created a series of 20 images in collage or watercolor that explore Homer's Odyssey. In the Odyssey, Bearden found themes of wandering, mourning, and seeking a way home to be very relevant to the African-American experience. This image of the fall of Troy with its burning buildings and sailing ships rendered with flat layered areas of color seems to echo the powerful two-dimensional images on the Greek vases. Now Odysseus survived burning Troy and the aftermath, but Poseidon, the god of the sea, would not let him return to his home in Ithaca so easily. For years, Odysseus would wander the seas trying to return. Artists found inspiration in Homer's Odyssey that equaled their fascination with the Iliad. The inside of this ancient Greek cup shows Odysseus sailing on a wine-red sea as he tries to return home to Ithaca. His encounter with the one-eyed giant, the Cyclops Polyphemus, offered a Greek artist inspiration for this remarkable depiction on an amphora. Here we see Odysseus and his crew attack Polyphemus, blinding him with a spear, as above them on the neck of the amphora, two large eyes look out at us. A few centuries later, the Romans showed Polyphemus on a spectacular scale. Excavated in the 1970s, this colossal first century sculpture of the blinding of Polyphemus was created for the palace of the second Roman emperor, Tiberius, for his villa on the Amalfi coast at Sperlonga. The group sat on an island within a watery grotto where the emperor dined in a fantasy environment on the shores of the Mediterranean where Odysseus once sailed. Soon after 
after his encounter with Polyphemus, he came upon the Enchantress, who used a potion to turn some of Odysseus's sailors into pigs. On this Greek crater, a pot created to hold wine, we see a man transformed into a pig, following behind Odysseus, who pursues Circe, as her crater that held the potion falls to the floor. She proved hard to resist, though, and Odysseus remained in her company for a year. 2,000 years later, Circe still beguiled. The English artist William Waterhouse painted her three times. First, he showed her offering the cup to Odysseus, who stands reflected in the mirror beneath her left arm. Clad in diaphanous gray, she sits on her throne and slowly brings him under her spell. Pale skinned with long auburn hair, she defines the late 19th century femme fatale, the fatal woman. Circe also appears in the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphosis, where she transforms into another character from the Odyssey, the sea monster Scylla. Here, in Waterhouse's Circe Invidiosa of 1892, she will transform into Scylla to win the love of a man as her potion drops from her cup into the sea. Like the earlier image, she seems to be the fatal woman, but is this what she desires or is it her fate? Perhaps seeking knowledge is her downfall, for here in The Sorceress from 1911, inscribed Circe on the back by the painter Waterhouse, she is shown seeking knowledge. It reminds me that Homer's Circe, whom he called the dreadful goddess with lovely hair and human speech, advised Odysseus to seek knowledge by visiting the underworld something no mortal had ever done. Doing that, he may learn to appease the gods and discover how to return home to claim his kingdom. I think of Circe as a woman seeking knowledge and power. When I look at photographer Julia Margaret Cameron's Circe from 1865 as well, Cameron photographed her family members and hoped to elevate photography to the level of all the other arts with images that were taken from classical literature and other subjects. Here, the grapes wreathing the girl's head represent the potions of Circe. Cameron inscribed the image, Who Knows Not Circe, Daughter of the Sun. She was quoting the 17th century poet John Milton, who actually wrote in Comus, who knows not Circe, daughter of the sun, whose charm cupped whoever tasted, lost his upright shape and downward fell into groveling swine. In so many ways, this image of Circe reminds me of Madeline Miller's story. Now, Romar Bearden, too, showed us a new Circe for the 20th century, as Miller did. Dressed here in brilliant colors, she sways gently with a docile lion, one of her attributes from Homer, at her feet, and tame snakes coiled about her. She, too, has a work table, and looking there, she gazes on a skull that represents her many potions. Odysseus did finally return home. He resisted the call of the sirens by lashing himself to the mast. We see their dangerous songs moving through the air like birds 
as Odysseus resists their call here on a Greek amphora. They call to him as well from the land in this work by Roman mosaic artists who depicted his journey using thousands of small pieces of tile, tesserae, showing us the man, the ship, and the sirens who lured so many sailors to their fates. Romar Bearden brought the wanderer safely back into port in Ithaca, with home to Ithaca. Instead of showing Odysseus asleep and sneaking into his home port to learn what had happened in his absence, Bearden shows us a triumphant man standing on the bow of the ship as his home comes into view. He holds a shield in one hand and a spear in the other, creating a myth that was universal so that, as Bearden put it, a child in Benin or Louisiana could understand its importance. But the story doesn't end with Odysseus waiting for him at her loom day in and day out has been a woman very different from Circe, Odysseus's loyal wife, Penelope. Surrounded by suitors who hoped to take her and all of Ithaca, Penelope, waiting, weaving by day and undoing her work by night, telling the men around her that she would marry when her weaving was done. Here we see her at her loom with her son, waiting year after year for her husband's return. Her waiting and her weaving kept her free from the bonds of another marriage and kept their kingdom intact. In 1994, the artist Janine Antoni created Slumber and showed us her version of Penelope's loom with a blanket woven from shreds of her nightgown on the floor below the threads of the loom. And Tony wondered, what if the adventures of Odysseus had never taken place, but were instead the dreams of Penelope? What if we've been telling Penelope's story as Madeline Miller told Circe's tale? We've started today by looking at images from the 5th century BCE. We've concluded with images from very late in the 20th century. And we, of course, have Madeline Miller's masterful tale of Circe. I think there can really be no better tribute to the universality of the work of Homer than the work that we've seen today and Madeline Miller's book. Thank you.